and welcome to the surge model the mosh medina along with my partners as always the hall of fame coach tony grijalva and my man christian molinar who does not want to admit that he's sad because the Steelers lost. But, I mean, I'm just messing with you, dog. I'm just – you got the terrible towel up there, you know. I'm just saying that because because Cowboys won, you know. I mean, they won by a miracle, you know, last second shot. So, uh, Coach, what's up, baby? How you feel? Uh, doing well, Monster. Doing well. All right, good. Uh, so, we are here. Another week of high school football is in the books. Uh, last week, a lot of the teams had uh, the bye week, but – um. Uh, everybody's back. The starter of district coach before we play the highlights yep. and the scoreboard and all that stuff. Uh, all the preseason stuff, you know, the it this is the time, this is the time to shine for everybody here. At district, I mean, how would you get your team revved up for this week? Well, well, just very, uh, very easily get them to understand that uh, the season starts this week. And for those that have district games, you know, it is a uh, this is what you've been working for. Uh, all off season, uh, early in the season, uh, in preseason, trying to iron out every 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 problem that you might have, and now you know you, you get to the part of the season now, monster, where you know at in, on any day, any Friday afternoon, Friday night, or Thursday night, you know, any team can be any team. So really, you know, if, if you're going in with the attitude that ah this is this easy week, then uh, you're going to be surprised. And Christian, when you used to play, I mean, how ramped up would you get knowing that this is it, man? District starts now. Yeah, those first three uh, weeks, it's all about tuning up. I know everybody wants to shoot 10 and 0, but when you have a tough uh, pre district schedule, use that to get better for this moment. You could have gone 0 and 3, but as long as you, you win out this, you're the district champ. So this, this is where it matters. This, this is where we're all 0 0, and we're all pull, pulling ahead, and, and there's no easy weeks. Uh, you don't take any days off. You play through it, and, and you go for it. This is this is when it really starts to matter, and this is you just feel that energy because it's a fresh start all the way through. Zero zero. Here we go. You just buckle it up, and we, we attack full force and, and don't let up. All right, that's good to know. I mean, uh, I mean, this is it. This is the time where you get to shine and stuff like that for everybody. Uh, let's take a look at the scoreboard that we had this past week. You know, there was, those are the big scores there. Like I said, a lot of the six A teams, uh, a lot of the, some of the five A teams had had the uh, the night off, but everybody's going to play this week. So we got the scoreboard there for a little bit. But as as we always do, it's time to play the highlights from this past week that was a shot by all our reporters right here at DP Sports Network.
son équipe Touchdown Rangers And there you have the highlights from this past uh, weekend's uh, games. They're shot by all our reporters at EP Sports Network. Now, if you want to see this live as it's happening, uh, check out our Twitter page. It's at EP Sports Net. And all those videos and the scores are updated live as, as, as soon as that happens. You know, we put the videos up there. Uh, once again, that's EP Sports Net on Twitter. We got Facebook as well, so check out our Facebook page at Peace Sports Network and also Instagram. So let's look at the scores once again, gentlemen. Uh, El Dorado beat Clint, Riverside were Horizon, Burgess versus Sanks, Isleta versus Jefferson, Cano Tio del Valle, that exciting game that um, 34 28 in overtime, Chapin all over Irvin, Parkland uh, Blanks, Bowie, Bel Air all over San Lizario, uh, Cathedral uh, beats Anthony Bell by a point. Pecos beats Fabians. Iran over Tornillo. Jefferson, uh, of course, uh, that's a misprint there. Uh, Isleta beat uh, Jefferson. And Mountain View beat Hatch Valley uh, 45 to 0. So, coach, let's just start off with the game that you were at, at there at Jefferson when the Isleta Indians came back from behind to win that game. Give me your thoughts on that crazy game, coach. Well, you know, I was looking forward to this game, to that game all week. Uh, you know, going to Jeff, going to the stadium at Jeff. You know, I had been to Jeff many times before uh, while I was coaching. But, uh, you know, there was never a stadium. So it was only for a JV game or, or for a freshman game. It was never for a varsity game. But, uh, you know, the electricity, the atmosphere there at, at Jefferson Stadium was just, you know, it, it was just something else. It's, it's a different type of environment down there. And then you had that wave of love at the end of the first quarter, which is something that you know everyone should experience at least once. I mean, that's it's just an awesome, awesome feeling to to see what the, uh, what they do there for the for the wave of love when when they wave to the to the kids at, at the hospital. And you know, it, it's it was overall it, it was just an amazing experience. It, it it really was. You know, Jefferson got out to a 21-0 start, Nathan Akala and, and the the uh, Jefferson offense. Oh boy, they were rolling in the first quarter. Twenty-one points. Uh, it, it looked like you know they were going to get ready to score over fifty. Uh, uh, we're sitting there in the press box thinking, yeah, it's going to be a blowout. Uh, so all of a sudden they stop the game, they do the wave of love, and as soon as they come back on the field, what happens at the beginning of the second quarter? Well, it's Isleta's turn. So Isleta comes back and scores three touchdowns, goes in twenty-one, twenty-one at half, and 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 now we got a ball game. And basically, monster, it just came down to whoever had the ball last. It just so happened that uh, uh, kudos to Coach Joe Martinez uh, of the uh, Isleta Indians. You know, time management that he that he had uh, in that fourth quarter, uh, trying to maneuver the ball down for that for that uh, that touchdown. That last film clip that you saw there is uh, Damian Contreras going in for the uh, for the winning touchdown with something like five seconds left. So. You know, overall, it was a great experience, and it was an awesome game. Neither team has anything to hang their heads about. A tremendous game. Christian, your thoughts on this game? Because I know you're following it intensely on Friday night as well. Yeah, I really just 
you know, me and Coach were talking about it before uh, the game even started. We really were just kind of seeing where Jefferson, if they could get to that 4 0 jump. And I'm watching the updates as Coach is bringing them in, and I'm thinking, Jeff's going to run away with this. And then, like Coach said, just back and forth, back and forth, looking at the highlights and looking at the stats. It just turned into a fireworks show. You were in for a really good game. I think that's why everybody wanted to watch that game uh, live because of the atmosphere and the experience. And it ended up, you know, it ended up showing really well that East Sleda and Jefferson have really good programs, kind of not talked about a lot, but Jefferson's really put themselves on the map to make that district just a little bit tougher. And East Sleda's finding out, you know, how they're going to be able to compete with, with Parkland and, and Canapio and how they're going to give them trouble. I think those are two good teams that could spoil anybody's uh, chances at district uh, at a district title, really. Uh, just really good football on both sides, and they can score really well. Speaking of Cano Tio, they, they, they proved me wrong, Coach. Last week I was saying that Del Valle is going to go undefeated. I think they're good enough to go 10-0, and 0, things of that nature. Del Valle is number three in our rankings. All of a sudden, next thing you know, Cano Tio go out there and they just did what they had to do. Actually, they uh, you got to give uh, Coach Rudy Contreras a lot of credit because as Christian, as you said it, during that Jeff or East Letter game, it looks like Jeff was going to just blow them out. Same thing was going on with Cano Tio Del Valle. It was 14-0, I think, at at halftime or at one point or something of that nature. So that was a crazy game, but they came back. Del Valle battled all the way back, got it into overtime, but Canotillo was able to get that victory, tremendous victory there. Uh, so, Christian, we'll start with you, brother. What do you think of this game, how it panned out? Well, really, we talked about Canotillo's having a signature defense. Coach Scott Brooks always has a really good plan defensively on how he's going to attack his opponents. I think they executed that really well. It was kind of a shocker, but Del Valle had a lot of mistakes, especially the red zone turnovers, which kind of limited their opportunities early on. But again, like you alluded to, giving giving credit to Del Valle for finding a way to, to kind of climb back into that game and make it exciting going into overtime. But you can just kind of see how when Del Valle, when uh, excuse me, when Canadio locks in defensively, how well that team uh, is. They feed off their defense. They create turnovers in their offense with L.J. Martin. That kid is absolutely amazing offensively. He does it all for them, and it was just a great game. Uh, didn't expect it to go that way. I know you had made that prediction of Del Valle not losing at all, but here comes Del uh, Canadillo just doing mm -hmm. what they do best, and that's defense creating turnovers. Yeah, and as I look at the scores, the way the scoring went, Coach, it was actually 14-0 to at halftime. Then at one point, it was 21-7. to So Del Valle scored 21 points in the fourth quarter to tie it up to send it into overtime. So uh, just a tremendous game, Coach. Give me your thoughts on this game. Well, you know, as we had talked many, many times before, you know, Coach Brooks, uh, you know, his signature is on the defensive side of the ball. As, as Christian said, you know, that's where they hang their hat, you know, Strong play from their linebackers, aggressive play from from their from their front people. You know, uh, Asus Carrillo plays linebacker. He's got 45 tackles. He's got 10 tackles for losses. He's got three sacks. Uh, that that's for the season. So he is all over the field. And uh, you know, I, I think one of the one of the best indicators of the strength of Cantillo defense uh, is the, uh, the the running back Christian Martinez for Del Valle. 15 carries, 21 yards. You know, and, and that that to me was the most surprising stat. On the other side of the ball, as Christian mentioned, you got L.J. Martin. You know, the kid, uh, he's only a junior. He's got one more year left. You know, but you know, you look at the some of the things that he does. He had 20 carries, 214 yards, two touchdowns. He had that 80-yard reception that we saw there on on the film clip, uh, and then he also had the big interception in the overtime period. Uh, you know, so uh, you know, as long as you have athletes of that caliber. Uh, either on offense or on defense, you know, you're going to win the majority of the game. So I, I think Kenny Tio gained a lot of confidence this past Friday, and I think it's going to carry out throughout the rest of the season. No doubt it's going to be interesting to see how it plays this week. I mean, they got Mountain View this week, so we're giving, I mean, it's going to be a tough task for Mountain View there. Uh, Christian, let's talk about the game that you're at, Clint at El Dorado now. That looked like... It was going to be El Dorado all day, all night, but all of a sudden, Clint came back, and they almost were able to win that game. Give me, give me the thoughts on how that game went out there at the sack. Yeah, you know, there's nobody in, in the press box 
except me. So, you know. Just, <laughs> hey, you know, hey, let me just let you know, me and Coach I, have I been like that. Like, the past couple of Friday, <laughs> that Thursday nights there at the sack. at least I think the first three weeks, it was just me and Coach. I mean, it was good because we got we got, we got got yeah, fed pretty good. So, it was it was nice. So, but give me the thoughts on that game, Chris. <laughs> but, you know, it just kind of gives you the vibe that really this game doesn't deserve coverage. And first play for El Dorado, interception. And Clayton gets in the red zone. They go ahead 7-0. And you're starting to think, well, that's a little, you know, bonus for Clint, and El Dorado should kind of buckle down, and, and that didn't happen. You know, they they got stopped at the 50. Clint got the ball back again, drove down in that that hard to stop uh, wing offense. They drove down, and now we're 14-0. And then El Dorado gets up, and we're 14-14. And Isaiah Rudison, you know, he had I think 19 carries for just right around 300 yards and he scored all the touchdowns for Eldorado and it really got exciting you know they go into halftime it's 20 uh, 19 couple of missed field goals uh, Clint tried to go for two and it's a one-point game at halftime and you start to think Eldorado maybe kind of buckles down and kind of re you know refocuses and pulls away and they look like they were going to uh, but they kind of let up. There was no score uh, for Clint in third quarter. Eldorado gets one touchdown, and you think that's enough to separate as long as Clint doesn't get near the red zone. Well, the thing was is Clint kind of answers back and goes for two, and it's 30-27. They get another stop, and they're marching down. And, and let me tell you this, eight passes in the first three games for Clint. So they don't pass very wow. often. Yeah. That last drive, they pass five times. They get all the way to the ten. So you're starting to think, wow, like Clint might have, might really upset El Dorado, and unfortunately, a couple of penalties and a sack, and time runs out. But it was very exciting all the way up to the end, screaming in the press box all to myself, uh, getting excited <laughs> and invested. But you know, hey, it was a really great game, really good treat. Yeah. Uh, Coach, give me your thoughts on this game. Then after that, I have a specific question when it comes to. Uh, a uh, point after attempts. Give me your thoughts on this game, Clint El Dorado. Clint showing a lot of heart, almost winning this game. They, they they did. You know that, that offense that they run. You know that's that's a ground and pound offense, as Christian said. You know they're not going to throw the ball very often. They're, they're going to run it. That's what they're going to hang their hat on. Uh, Isaiah Gonzalez, the quarterback, thirteen carries, one hundred and forty three yards, three touchdowns. You know that's that's what you do on a ground game. On the other hand, you have you have an El Dorado team. Uh, I've, I've already seen them twice. And they have some good athletes on offense, uh, as uh, Christian mentioned. Isaiah Reddison, you know, over 200 yards rushing, four touchdowns. You know, he he did pretty much everything that that has been asked of him. If you've ever seen him run, he, he's he's a big bone kid, you know, and and he's he's he looks very strong. He, he runs hard. You also have Andre Thomas, the wide receiver. You know, he's he's a pretty good athlete also. I think the problem with El Dorado, they're they're still having trouble understanding the scheme defensively. And, and I think that's that, that's where you know that's where their weaknesses it is right now. But you know what? If they can continue to work hard defensively and understand that scheme a little bit better, you know they've got the athletes on offense to to contend, uh, you know, and play with anybody really. One of the things I've always noticed is the how hard is it, coach, to teach these young players to be a field, field goal kicker. Because, I mean, I see that a lot of the players, a lot, how many times do we see the point after attempt is no good, So or sometimes they just end up going for two. I mean, how hard is it as a coach to try to convince a player, hey, we need – every team needs a, a kicker, you know. Every team needs a yes. kicker. How yes. hard is it to find that player? Oh, well, it, it's hard. What I did at Franklin is I went to the soccer coach and asked him, hey, give me your best kicker, someone that someone that uh, has good grades, so I don't have to keep uh, tabs on him. But uh, no, and, and it's not just a kicker, Monster. You know, it, it's it's a cohesive unit. It, it's not just a kicker. You know, you've got to have, you have, you have a good snap. Okay? You have to make sure that everyone in the line blocks down like they're supposed to. You know, you need to have somebody with good hands to hold the ball. And, you know, you have to have a good snap. So, you know, it, it's something that uh, – uh, but but you're right. There, there are a lot of teams that really don't, in my opinion, don't spend enough time practicing, okay? they they That's one of those uh, skills where, they you know, most coaches tell the kicker, okay, you go off to the side over there and you practice by yourself and kick the ball over the goalposts, you know? And, you know, although that, that does help in the skills of actually uh, making an impact on the ball – you know, that doesn't really help with the 11 man scheme of you know let's put all this together and so that that's what makes it hard then of course you, you also have some some really good kickers uh, mm -hmm. uh so far this year that i that i've seen uh the eastwood kicker comes to mind right away uh there are a couple of others that have hit 40 yarders 
But, uh, you know, yeah, it, it is something that I, I think uh, sometimes we tend to sort of put in the back burner because we're worried about our offense and worried about our defense. And, and you know, sometimes the, the game can come down, the, the district title can come down to a kick. Well, if you look at the game between Isleta and Jefferson, it's just one point, you know, when you yeah. look at that situation. <laughs> uh, Christian, your thoughts on the uh, point after attempt. I mean, don't lie to me, man. Did you ever think about being the kicker when you're playing your high school days there at Burgess, even though you had you had that running back that scored four touchdowns yesterday for the Green Bay Packers on your team? Did you ever think about maybe being the kicker? You know, surprisingly, there's a little there's a little nugget here. Um, surprisingly, my dad was a kicker. He was a kicker in college, and I, I think a, a lot of times, oh, growing, yeah, he uh, he would take me out to do field goals, and I would hit them. But it just never really, it never really intrigued me. And he really, you know, got down and he taught me how to kick field goals, and it just never really interests me as much as it did with him. And you know, a, a kind of a story that he doesn't like talking about, but I love hearing it, is when he was in college at Oklahoma Panhandle. The Denver Broncos uh, scout came up to him and said, hey, when you graduate, we're going to come pick you up and you're going to be a kicker for us. Uh, but my dad didn't believe it. My grandpa didn't believe it. They, he came back home and he started working on the railroads and he never heard back from him. But he was a really good kicker. And it's hard finding kickers and coaches, right? I remember back in Burgess, they would just put Dan Hernandez, the guy who takes video for us, they would just put them off in the practice field and say, hey, kick field goals, do what you got to do. We'll check on you later and we'll call you over when we got to do <laughs> the team. I mean, they just left him alone. We didn't have anybody really teaching him. He was self-taught, and I think that's kind of hard. And going back to what you're saying, Clint, they have a, a fantastic kicker. This kid was putting him out of the end zone on, on uh, kickoffs, and he almost hit that 49-yard uh, field goal to tie the game. He had a really, really good leg. I just think the few – the two that he missed were blocked, so I, I don't think they were missed. I think it was just a scheme issue, and that forced Clint to go for two. So it, it's hard finding good kickers, but there's kickers out there. But uh, Coach is right. There's not enough attention uh, being delivered to these guys to kind of perfect the skill of it and the art of it. And, that, and now you kind of see that it yeah. matters. Well, it's like I said, like, and, and I see it all the time where, like, where we're doing the scoring updates because I handle the doing, doing that stuff for Twitter, and I see – a PAT no good you know a lot like more than you guys expect yeah. you know uh as yeah. every is I'm looking at every game so I think that's a position that I think all the coaches got to spend more time on on special teams because those points like I said it's not a loss by it's not a one by one game you know by one point excuse me you know you look at that and then uh, some other games came down to the wild Anthony and Cathedral that was a one point game 20 to 19 yeah. there you know, look at that situation. So, what are the teams that impressed us? They were in the uh, that jumped a lot in the the rankings when we reveal them uh, later on uh, in the in the program. Is the Riverside Rangers? Uh, they beat the Horizon Scorpions forty six to thirty six. And as the other games we were talking about, it looked like they were going to run away from Horizon. You know, at one point the game was twenty twenty four to seven in that nature. I think that's the score was at halftime. But then that's when Horizon uh, found that running game coach and they were able to kinda like make it respectable. And I think it wasn't until like maybe until like maybe three minutes left to go in the game when I, I think uh Riverside was finally able to pull away uh by ten points there. But tremendous job by Coach Paulo Melendez there uh with the Scorpions. Well he certainly did uh, you know they're they're led by you know offensively by the quarterback Gijas, uh who was uh, twelve of uh, for one forty two at two touchdowns and then of course Ernie Garcia you know another hundred yard game seems like every week he he go, runs for at least a hundred and a uh, couple of touchdowns I, I think one of the big keys here in this game at Monster was that uh, the running back for Riverside Jose Guardado did not play. And, and I, I think that Riverside sort of missed him a little bit. I think uh, uh, Angel Munoz took over a little bit more of the rushing uh, uh, part of it as opposed to throwing the ball so much. And, you know, Riverside so far this season has been a balanced, has been, been pretty much a balanced team. Yeah, they run the ball a little bit more, but they can throw whenever they need to. So, you know, I, I think that's that's where uh, that created some problems for for Riverside. But but you're right. Coach Melendez did, did a great job trying to come back. He just – you know, just didn't have enough there at the end. Christian, your thoughts on this game? Yeah, Riverside, you know, looks like they're rolling. And I think there's a theme that we're kind of noticing is teams are letting up. You know, they get ahead and they get comfortable. Mm -hmm. 
these kids yeah. think it's going to be easy and that the other teams are just going to roll over. We've seen that in a couple of games that we've talked about. And you see that, you know, these teams are not quitting. They're fighting back all the way through, and, and Horizon did that well. But, you know, you kind of see the swag that we're talking about with Riverside every week. We talk about the uniforms, the locker rooms, everything that they do. You see that swag, you know, when they're missing guys, they're still putting up a lot of points. And it's just not fit, like not finishing, letting Horizon hang around. Uh, but I think that teams are going to learn from that. I think Riverside will learn to just kind of keep their foot on the gas and not really let up. But when you're missing a guy like Gallardo, it's, it's, it changes the dynamic a little bit. Less passing, more rushing from your quarterback. A little bit, a uh, little bit of those pieces are moving around. The Riverside did a good job putting up all the points that they did, and that's just a high-powered offense that'll just continue to be high-powered in, in their division. Um, as I look at the rest of the scores, a lot of the scores were. Um the only, the only other game that was really close was Cathedral and Anthony. But a lot of the other scores, I just want to like kind of go over and say because we know what the situation, for example, the Burgess Mustangs got another victory there. They beat the Hanks Knights. We've talked about this uh, so many times on this program, how young Hanks is, you know. At one point, the closest the game was was 14-6, to six, Coach. And then after that, it was just uh, the Tavares Jones show, you know. He even threw for a touchdown as well, you know. I think my man Bill Kuhn was kind of surprised because he hadn't seen Tavares Jones in person. So <laughs> they end up winning that game 68-6. to six, So uh, we'll talk more about Burgess when we preview the rest of these games. And with Hanks, we said, like, they, they got their one victory last week, two weeks ago. Uh, it's going to be a learning experience because they're a very young team. Uh, as far as Chapin and Irvin goes, you know, I mean, this game was out of hand right away. It was at one point, I believe it was 21. I think it was at one point 41 to zero, you know, in the third quarter. I think uh, Irvin didn't get their touchdown until the fourth quarter. And even with that, you know, uh, Chapin still scored another two running touchdowns. So 56 to 14 was the final there. And then, you know, we've, we've discussed uh, the problems that uh, the Blue Bears have there with personnel, you know, unique situations uh, because of what's going down there. Parkland just, you know, had their way with them. 50-0 to zero was the final score there uh, with uh, the Parkland and Bowie. And then the Beller Highlanders got another victory there against Sanelli. Sanelli struggling this year, gentlemen. 45-7 um, to seven was the score there. So that basically wraps up all the, the scoring that we saw. So we can move on now to district starts. And it starts, there's actually three games on Thursday, guys. First game, Austin versus Chapin. And that game's going to be at Irvin. And, of course, Austin is in our uh, top uh, 10. You know, they were in the top 10 last week. They're still in the top 10. So, Christian, we'll get it started with you, man. You know, Austin versus Chapin. Remember, Austin, for me, is I think Austin is the most impressive team because the last time I saw them play, they only dressed like maybe 22, 23 cats, you know. So, when they're, you got a lot of guys in playing Ironman football. Uh, man, that's a tough team to face there, even though this game uh, is a home game for Chapin. Yeah, that's, that's an impressive team. I think arguably they stand out the most just number-based and they're still executing, they're still winning. This is a very uh, tough test right off the bat against a Chapin team who's starting to figure it out a little bit. They're starting to get the pieces going. They're starting to like drum up wins. They're starting to lock down defensively. So you're catching Chapin on the up. Austin, who you know had a, a, win, a loss uh, two weeks ago, uh, I guess a very good uh, Roswell team. Uh, you know, they're kind of, but they had this week to get healthy, get reorganized, and, and that came at the right time for them, especially with how small that roster is. So this is a very intriguing matchup. You know, Chapin on the up, Austin kind of resetting. It's what what way would you rather have District start than with this kind of battle? You know, you thought Chapin early on. You know, when they played Andrews, they didn't look very good. Yeah. You know, Andrews really well so you thought Chamber wasn't going to be a good football yeah. program but now they're yeah. starting to click so this this is a very intriguing matchup for a Thursday uh, and of course, our very own David Paul Oliver will be there covering all that, getting the videos for us and the scores for EP Sports Network coach. Big game, how you see this one going? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm kind of uh, skeptical about Austin, as Christian said, you know, uh, starting off with a loss right before the bye week. I, I don't, I don't, I, you know, I never liked to do that myself when, when I was coaching. On, on the other hand, it gives them a chance to heal that they had any injuries. You know, it gives them an extra an extra week of practice. Uh, Chapin, on the other hand, 
you know, they're, they're flying high right now. They, they've got a lot of confidence. And, uh, you know, this is going to be a district game. So, you know, this, this is for all the marbles. This, this is where it starts counting. I think it's going to be an evenly, an evenly matched game. But I think the key is going to be Austin's defense. Can Austin's defense uh, stop Mason Stadifer and, uh, and the offense? And if they can do that and play their usual ball control offensive game, you know, that I think Austin has a shot. And by the way, that game is on Thursday at 6.30. Thursday. It's a Thursday game. So uh, I forgot to show the rankings, the uh, top 10 rankings. So here they are uh, going into week four. Uh, like some of these teams didn't play, so they didn't go down. They just went up. So Eastlake stays at number one, gentlemen. Eastwood stays at number two. Uh, Franklin moves up to number three because Del Valle lost. Kind of deal making the jump because they beat Del Valle to number four. Uh, the Andrew Seagulls uh, stay at number five. Del Valle drops all the way down to number six. The Riverside Rangers went up three spots, and now they're ranked seventh in our uh, rankings here at EP Sports Network. There's Austin team we're talking about at eight. The Montwood Rams are at nine. And look at that. The Sleda Indians make an appearance there at 10 because that the only, there's only one team that left uh this this week in the in the uh, rankings and that was the Jefferson Silver Foxes and of course that's because he slid up beat them so they made the switch there gentlemen so um you guys okay with the uh the the the, the week 4 rankings okay with the uh as we like to call it, the top 10 everything's square there you all agree with that you know it'll be interesting to see what happens this week so let's talk about one of those teams that you said they went down you know and then another team won by 68 to 6 burgess uh we talked about that victor over hanks and jefferson lost last second game against the sledos but this game is at jefferson guys burgess versus jefferson uh coach we'll start off with you how do you see this game going well, you know, again, this is a district game. I need to correct myself. The the, the Andrews Chapin game is not a district game. Chapin is in, is in a different district. But uh, yes, you know, yes. it's 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 it is going to. It's a big question mark for Jefferson. How is Coach Tony Martinez's team going to react after that devastating loss? Because you know, as I was walking on the field, uh, you know, walking to my car, you know, there was a lot of disappointed Silver Foxes around. You know, and. They they were they were riding sky high going into the game. Obviously, they they lost the game. It doesn't matter whether you lose by one point or by a hundred points. You know, you still feels the same when it's a loss. You, you, there is there is no consolation to that. But uh, on the other hand, this is a, going to be a district game. You know, Burgess has uh, has seemed like that they, they have steadied the ship a little bit after struggling to start the to start the season. You know, Tavares Jones is is sort of gaining some ground here. So uh, to me, it's going to be uh, Tavares Jones against the Jefferson defense because the Jefferson offense will be able to score. They're, I have no doubt in my mind that they won't. They're not going to be able to score. But will their defense be able to stop the Burgess offense? And I think that's that's where the the win and loss is going to come from. So Christian, I'll ask you that question: There will the Jefferson defense be able to contain Tavares Jones? I, I think they might be able to get a stop or two, and that might be the difference. I, I, I fully expect this game to be a shootout. Um, yeah. Jefferson's yeah. able to put up points, and Burgess is starting to click on the cylinders. And before the season started, you would have chalked it up as a Burgess W. But as things have kind of progressed through the season, and that's the beauty of it. You can't really rely on what the paper says preseason. Uh, when you kind of drum it all together, now we're, we're in for a shootout. We're in for Jefferson putting up points through the air and in the ground, and we're looking for, for Burgess with Travaris Jones in the backfield. And now it's really going to come down to who can get a stop late in the game and, and give their offense one more shot at going ahead. That's what I kind of expect for it to be. I think Burgess has a little bit uh, stronger defense, but it's just minimum. I fully expect them to just go back and forth. And by the way, that game is also on Thursday at 6.30 there at, at Jeff. Uh, the game, uh, 7 o'clock at the sack. Ooh, the Eastwood Troopers playing the Pebble Hill Spartans. And, of course, the Spartans really haven't been, aren't the same team they were last year. And, of course, yeah. the Eastwood Troopers, they'd be number one. But, you know, they uh, only went to uh, San Antonio to play one of the toughest teams out there that they've got, you know, and uh, were able to score more points than anybody has. So, Coach... Uh, this is an Eastwood team that is very um, impressive, you know, offensively there. Yeah. So what what, what, what do uh, uh, Coach Dodas and the Spartans have to do to slow down this offense from the Eastwood Troopers? Wait. Well, you know, Monster, I, I think in a way they're, they're kind of like in the same situation as Austin. You know, they, they ended a loss before the bye week. You know, and, and so you, know, you can think of it as 
uh, these kids had two weeks to think about their loss. Okay, now how are they gonna how are they gonna react to that? You know, are, are they gonna change their uh, uh, change their motivation? Are, are they gonna be more motivated coming into as a district game? And I, I think you know, Coach Lopez is, is not gonna let the, it, them uh, have a, a downtime or, or any type of uh, uh, down system. So you know, I, I think that uh, uh, when you're going into a game like this, I think the question right now is with Pebble Hills. Coach Mark Torres has to figure out. You know how to get some stops because you know you know they're gonna have to defend the pass. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, there's, no yep. doubt, there's no doubt about that, and uh, I guess it could come down to ball control. If, if Pebble Hills offense can control the ball, control the tempo a little bit, keep the ball away from Andrew Martinez, you know, getting going into that fourth quarter, you know, maybe they have a shot. But if it's if it's a blowout early or Eastwood scores early and often, then yeah, it, it could get pretty messy. Christian, how do you see this one going? I think what Pebble Hills can do is, well, they've had two weeks to prepare, so they've had plenty of time to dissect the film and, and kind of figure it out. I think the best film you can kind of maybe look at is the Parkland first half uh, against Eastwood because Parkland had Eastwood in fits. Part, uh, Eastwood likes to kind of take those big shots and get the big plays and get mm -hmm. chunk yardage. Uh, and Parkland kind of kept everything in front of them and did not let that happen. They kind of let everything just kind of play in front in the first like five or six yards. Those little curl routes were open and, and Andrew Martinez just wasn't taking them. He was trying to get the deep ball going early on and that kind of rattled them. And I think that's what Pebble Hills will have to do is not let anything get behind them, keep everything in front and kind of bend, don't break until they get down and make them drive all the way down. And then you can kind of close the field in on them a little bit and then just ball control, like Coach said. But Eastwood, they're going to get out early. They're, you know, they had that loss on them, and, and that's not what Eastwood wanted. They wanted that perfect record. That's a tough team. Yeah. It's been some we talked about. They're a top 50 team in the state. So that's a, that's not an easy task. But I'm, I'm sure they, they didn't hang their hat on that. They're going to rebound and just try to get a staple win over Pebble Hills. That game is up Thursday, 7 o'clock there, and uh, we might have some special coverage on that game. Just keep it locked on to EP Sports Network there. Uh, there's a hint. On Friday, uh, Eastlake uh, takes on America's there, and uh, Coach, uh, America's kind of reminds me of the same situation that Hanks is in, but not as bad, you know, where America's is a very young team. You know, they're very trying good. to find themselves. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. they're struggling on defense. You know, they're struggling on offense, you know. Uh, and it's going to be a tough task for Coach uh, Melton. Uh, and, of course, you got the number one team. The East Lake Falcons are just, like, very impressive there. So, Christian, we'll start off with you. Uh, this game, East Lake versus Americas at the SAC, 7 o'clock on Friday night. There has to be a little bit more, I guess, motivation on America's part. I believe it's their homecoming. And that's a tough draw to have Eastley come in. Who, who makes that decision? You know, <laughs> like, hey, we're going to like, I know, you know, I know it's limited because I know like, I think the first week, I think it was the Corals homecoming right off the yeah. bat, you know, because of the limitations that they have on the sack, the way it pans out. So I guess they might have just, just picked it like that, <laughs> you know, but right. yeah. yeah. But normally, normally Mondo, and I know Coach will attest to it, you try to find the win on your schedule before the season kicks off. And I, you know, now you're drawing the number one team on homecoming night. There will be a little motivation for America to, to do a little bit better, but they're such a young squad, and Eastlake has a lot to prove. They're, they're really focused on going undefeated and matching up with, you know, the other two top teams in that district to compete for a title. So they have they have their mission as well. Uh, I just fully expect Eastlake to kind of just do their thing, be a high-powered offense, get the stops on defense. But they can't think it's easy though. We talked about this in, in the beginning of the show any given week and when you have division football any given week you can get upset coach your thoughts on this game well you know uh coach Melton, you know he's been around for a while you know he he's known to have some tricks up, up his sleep and i'm sure he will i'm sure he will this week you know as evident by when they played Del Valle. you know america's got up early on Del Valle. they just they just couldn't finish you know they they were just they just got overpowered but uh you know because of their youth as as we talked about but, but I think, you know, America's, you know, Coach Mountain will have America's ready. But then on the other hand, you know, you're playing a team like Eastlake. I know we talked about Eastlake all, all, all season now with, with all of the uh, uh, weapons that they have, both offensively and defensively. You know, it, it's, I, I don't, I see maybe America staying in the game maybe by half. But 
uh, I think after that, uh, you know, that that straight that power of each yeah. is gonna uh, it's wear them down. Yeah, you just look at the personnel, and you know, it's just one of those years. Yeah. Like for the past couple yeah. of years, it was on the other side where you know you had Dumas there, who's gonna be playing at the Sumbul against UTEP this week. You know, That's as right. opposed to playing for America, so. Uh, it, it happens, you know, there's some rebuilding years. Uh, the Sleda Indians will be hosting the El, El Dorado Aztecs at the reservation there. That should be an interesting matchup. El Dorado finally gets that victory. He Sleda got that exciting win over Jefferson. Coach, how do you see this one panning out at the reservation? Our very own Henry Reina will be there, as he always is when it comes to Sleda. Well, you know, Sleda is always a tough drive home. You know, that's just uh, that's just a given. It, it, it's always that way. Uh, El Dorado's coming off a win, first win of the season, first win for Coach Martinez. So you know they should be in a little bit of a high. But uh, I think just the, the firepower offensively for the Sled Indians. What I saw anyway from last Friday, uh, you know, there's a lot of firepower there. And as I've talked about before, you know, El Dorado is, is still struggling a little bit defensively. So I think uh, that Isleta has the edge offensively. As long as they can limit their mistakes, uh, I think they can come up with another win. Christian, you say it the same way? Yeah, I, I do. I, you know, I think El Dorado, I think the way they can win is just let Isaiah Rudison run the ball round and pound. The kid can break him. He broke him against Clint, but I think if they can just have him control the possession for El Dorado, that'll be their best defense because Isleta has a very good offense. El Dorado still having communication issues. They did against Clint. They kind of missed a few assignments, talking after the snap, talking pre-snap, couldn't get lined up correctly. So I think their defense still has some issues to iron out. And it's going to be tough to iron them out against an Isleta team that can score as well as they do. So I think their best bet is to let Ruddison and company kind of ground and pound, and that'll keep them in the game. A big game in the west side. The Montwood Rams travel all the way to Franklin to take on the Cougars. Two teams that we have in our top 10. Uh, Aero Famaligi there. Um, Mr. McCorder there doing a, a good job with Franklin as well. This should be a tremendous uh, matchup. Our very own Mark Mena will be there. He's excited about that game. Coach, give me your thoughts on this game, Montwood versus Franklin. How do you see this one going? Well, the first thing that, that I would look at on that field, especially in pregame, is if number 25 is out there on the field. Because if Stephen Powers is out there, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little bit different, uh, the outcome. But if he'd be still out, and I'm not sure whether whether he's uh, uh, he's fit enough to play this week. But nonetheless, you know, Franklin uh, had a great game against Adris, I think, offensively and defensively. They shined on both sides of the ball. Uh, if Coach Horner can keep that defense uh, alert, okay, they have to stop uh, stop uh, Mr. Oaxaca. You know that's that's a given. That's one of the things that uh, uh, you know I'm sure that that they plan to do. But uh, other than that, uh, I think the the firepower overall, I think is a little the, the level is a little bit higher uh, on the Franklin sideline with both Sparks, uh, with Cameron Bird, uh, with uh, Miles McWhorter. And, and, and I think the uh, the offense can lead Franklin to a victory. The one thing that I noticed here, Christian, is both teams chose to play difficult opponents pre-district. Right. And they lost both those games, but still, they look very good when they did. Look at them now after when they didn't play anybody from out of town. So I think that's an intriguing matchup when you look at it. I think what both teams had in mind when they scheduled these tough games was to prepare them to take a shot at whoever was the first. I, I really think they were trying to prepare themselves to kind of come, you know, through the back door and sneak at a district title. I think that's their motivation for both sides is we're talking about East Lake and, and Eastwood being the top two dogs, but I really think the winner of this game can kind of sneak behind and get the right momentum going. They had they've had they both had pre district schedules that were extremely tough. I do agree with Coach. Franklin has a little bit of an edge offensively. And just I think it's going to actually come down to the defensive line and offensive line battles for both sides. That's kind of where the game's going to get dictated. Franklin has a really big offensive line. And I just think that's where the, the edge goes. I expect Franklin to win, but I, I just think this is going to be a really good game that, that a lot of people are focusing on right now. 
Uh, I think it's going to be a tremendous game. Like I said, Mark Mena is going to be very excited to be out there. A team, they finally got their first victory. The Dakota Bulldogs taking on the Coronado Thunderbirds. They're in West El Paso as well. Coach, can they do it two times in a row? Or more importantly, what do they have to do, the Bulldogs, to win uh, their second game of the year? Well, you know, I mentioned early on uh, in the season when I saw Socorro play, uh, you know, they, they, they are tough. <laughs> they have a tough team. They're big. Uh, they're aggressive. You know, and they finally got the first victory in, what, four or five years. Now they're looking for the first district victory. You know, Coronado so far struggling a little bit. Uh, I don't know if their quarterback, Tristan Escobedo, is going to be back or not. If he's not, then, you know, I, I see the Coronado T-Birds struggling a little bit offensively. You know, they've done pretty well defensively, but, uh, you know, once, once it gets to the late third quarter, early fourth quarter, you know, that they, they sort of get overpowered. And I think Socorro may may have that uh, that advantage there. But I see it being a close game either way, all the way through four quarters. I, I see it's going to be close as well, but I think the one thing that uh, the Bulldogs have got, they've got that momentum, you know, that they know that they yep. can do it, that they finally did it. You know, they got the football from Dave Campbell's. They made him the team of the week, things of that nature. So, uh, Christian, as a player, like, how do you come into this game? Like, if you're one of the score Bulldogs, like, how do you mentally be prepare for a game like uh, Coronado? You know, this this will be completely different, you know, for Socorro. They finally got the monkey off their back. They finally did get a win. It's been 53 games, I believe. You know, they, they feel relieved. You know, they just feel like they're on top of the world. Dave Campbell gave them the football. You know, it was talked about on social media like crazy. They kind of feel really confident, uh, a kind of confidence they haven't had in years. Now you're dealing with the Coronado team that hasn't won this year. So, you know, this, this kind of makes it for a game that we really preseason didn't think would have a lot of weight to it. But Coronado's 0-3. Socorro has its first win. You got a Socorro team with a lot of confidence. And you probably have a Coronado team that's been really frustrated, trying to get back on track. And they have their own motivation to get a win. So, you know, it's more intriguing than, yep. than we would have predicted early on. As like I said, it's going to be an interesting game there. Uh, our very own Bill Kuhn will be there. Uh, two high-powered offenses meet in Northeast El Paso. The Parkland Matadors host the Del Valle Conquistadores. Like I said, Parkland uh, destroyed uh, Bowie 50-0. Del Valle, you know, we had them number three last week. They lost the very end overtime to a, a, a tremendous kind of deal defensive team. So, Coach, we'll start off with you. You know, two high-powered offenses. I mean, eventually one of them is going to give. You know, it basically just depends who's got the better defense, right? Uh, that's exactly right, Monster. I think that's what it's going to come down to. But you know, I, I do want to mention, I, I don't know if you guys have seen that uh, uh, that highlight of uh, DJ, uh, uh, DJ Crest Daniels making that one-handed catch. He mm -hmm. caught one pass the other night for 48 yards and a touchdown, and he did it with one hand uh, in stride, which uh, you know, is pretty tough to do for a high school. You know, that's, one, that's something that you see in college and, and in the pro level. But uh, you're right. It's, it's going to be high-powered offense. Uh, I, right now, I give the edge defensively to Del Valle. But then the question mark is, how is Del Valle going to react after their first loss? And, and I think that's going to be the key for Coach Rudy Contreras to, uh, uh, to get that motivation back for the Conquistadores right before district play. And, and, and Christian, if you're Eric Franz, coach of the Parkland Matadors, how do you keep that momentum? Of course, you scored 50 unanswered points against Bowie. It's not going to be as easy against Del Valle. No, I, it's not going to be easy, but I think the conversation has to be had. Look at their schedule and how tough it's been. They've had Eastwood, they've had Eastlake, they've had Andrus. They've easily dealt with the top five, you know, three of the top five teams in this city. And then they had Bowie, and it was frustrating because they lost all three of those games. You know, they were in it in the Eastwood game. They were, you know, they came back against Andrus. They weren't really in it against Eastlake. But, you know, I think the Bowie game was like a frustrating type of, like, win to, like, say, no, we're not as bad as we as our record says we are. We're not an 0-3 team. We're better than that. I think that was kind of like a frustrating, like a staple kind of, like, thing for them to, to, to get that win over Bowie and to get their confidence back. Coach mentioned DJ Crest. DJ Crest looked incredible against Eastwood. He looked good against Parkland. I just think the, the thing that happened with Parkland is that their philosophy wasn't really to get those big jump balls. I think they had a switch in philosophy in the offseason when I was talking to one of the coaches. They had a different thing in mind. And all of a sudden, you have DJ Crest at 6'3", winning these jump balls. 
you know, that he won three against three guys against Eastwood. He's had one handed catches against Andrews. So now I think that philosophy is now dialed back a little bit to get him more involved and to, you know, ground and pound with Isaiah Beasley. So I think now they have those that one two punch. And now I just think now with Del Valle, they got the win, they feel a little more focused. Del Valle has a loss. I think now it's intriguing. I, I do think Del Valle's defense is a little bit better. Parkland has issues with communication. Obviously, they had no issues against Bowie last week, not giving up a single touchdown. But in the first three games, they had you know communication issues before the ball got snapped. I just I think now they have a little bit more momentum. I think it'll be closer, but I think Del Valle has the edge. And our very own uh, Chris Gomez will be covering that game. One other game I want to talk about uh, before we wrap up is the Horizon Scorpions uh, visiting the Bel Air Highlanders. Of course, uh, you saw we talked about the heart that the Scorpions did, and they almost came back and beat Riverside. So now they're taking a Bel Air team uh, that beat San Eli 45-7. I think this is going to be a close game. Christian, how do you see this one? Yeah, this will be close. Horizon, we talked about it. They have grit. Uh, they, they do fight. They don't give it all the way up. Uh, they, they don't give up is what I mean to say. Uh, you know, I live in the backyard of the Horizon Scorpions. I coach some of those kids in basketball. Like, I know the mentality that these kids have, and it's not to give up, and it's to fight. And they've been, they've been competitive, you know, even against Fort Stockton. When they got down, they came back. They found a way to kind of make it a close game. Uh, Bel Air, on the other hand, you know, they, they were up and down. We thought they could carry a little bit of momentum from last year. Uh, but you know when they played like a team like Burgess, they didn't they didn't do just that. So this will be much closer than people think. I think Horizon uh, they keep fighting and they don't give up. If, if Bel Air lets up Horizon, they leave the door open for Horizon to come back and win it. I just think it's going to be also they can run the ball, control the clock there, Coach. I mean, how do you see this one going, Bel Air versus Horizon? Well, it, it's it, it is going to come down to a battle of running games and see who has the strongest running game. Yeah, you, you, you've got uh, uh, you've got the, the, the horizon uh, uh, running back that, that I mentioned earlier, and then on the other side in Bel Air, you've got Nick Chavita, uh, who had 142 yards rushing this past week and three touchdowns. You know, he's a workhorse for the. Uh, uh, for the Bel Air Highlanders, and it, I see both teams tr trying to pound the ball at each other, and, and we'll see which which team gets the most first downs, and uh, obviously which one gets into the end zone. I don't think you're going to see very many passes thrown in this game. Uh, it's all going to be on the ground. And it, it's all going to happen on Friday night and Thursday night, and of course, if you want to get all the up-to-date scores and video highlights, I don't think anybody else does video highlights as it happens. Of course, it's only happening on our Twitter page at EP Sports Net on Twitter. So follow us on Twitter. Then afterwards, when all the games end, we'll have all the recaps, uh, video highlights of the coaches, players' interviews at epsportsnetwork.com. Gentlemen, I look forward to the uh, – finally, we got the games on Thursday and Friday. Then UTEP's back on Saturday as well versus New Mexico. As always, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I look forward to the games this weekend. So for Christian Molinar, the Hall of Fame coach, Tony Grijalva, Armando the Mouse from Dina, thank you for watching The Surge.